can can tell you how good it is to hear Kathy play the organ. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I have missed you. I have missed all of you and uh, am glad to be back here. Um, they tell me I am not contagious, so, but look how you guys are sitting. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, somebody should trust Jesus enough to sit in the front here. Um, um, but uh, um, I have uh, already talked more today than I have in, what, three weeks? And uh, so if you hear uh, me cough, it's not contagious, okay? Um, it'll be fine. And, uh, but it is good to be with you all. A couple of announcements that uh, you need to know about. You've probably noticed there are some cards out in the lobby of people that could just use a little extra encouragement from us all. Also, the wall of thanks made its way back up. Uh, we try and do that every November. Uh, so you, if you go right down to the bottom of the steps, it'll be right there. There are some post-it notes and some pens. Um, I would strongly encourage you and just to write down what you are thankful for and put it up there. And I would encourage you to go and read it and take a look. Um, um, I am always, uh, every year, uh, I, as, as I have to take it down, um, and Gerald's helped me a couple of times, and, and just reading the post-it notes, and it's just amazing. And so take advantage of it and just express your thanks um, out there as well. Uh, the uh, um, order sheet, the order form for poinsettias, for our Christmas Advent season are out there. Uh, make sure that you grab them. That is coming up fast. Okay, so this is going to be a little weird. You need to help me out. But there is somebody who every Sunday is part of our congregation online. All right? And it's her birthday today. <laughs> All right, and I consider the people online at church, okay? And, and they're just, you guys are just a part, you're as part of us as, as anybody here, okay? So, Dawn Green, all right? It is Dawn's birthday today. She watches every week. Somebody could probably look. She's probably online right now with us. We need to sing happy birthday to Dawn. Will you do that with me? Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Don, happy birthday to you, happy birthday Don. And she's on, see? She, she's there with us, so welcome. Welcome to everybody else that's uh, worshiping with us online as well. This morning, I would invite you to take a look at the screen. Um, there's lots of things happening in the life of the church. Make sure you look at them. Make sure you look at your bulletin. But this morning, we would like to share with you um, a testimony of what these are all about. I remember the day my mom left and she never returned. My sister and I were very young. I was about four and a half years old, and my sister is just a year older than me. And we were totally alone, didn't know what was going to happen next. Well, we were placed into an orphanage. And I was excited about meeting lots of children. I was excited to have lots and lots of friends that I never had in a village. But then I met the caregivers, and I got to know um, the kind of abuse that went on there in that place. And it was even worse than the abuse that I received from my father at home. But by God's grace, I was transferred from that orphanage, together with my sister, to a new orphanage uh, to begin school. And that is the orphanage where I received an Operation Christmas Child shoebox. But that faithful day in the year um, 2000, when I was 10 years old, we were told that we're going to have a special event and for all the children to go to the gym. 
none of us knew what this day will bring. Well, as I walked in, I saw this huge pile of boxes. There were shoe boxes, beautifully wrapped in Christmas paper. And it was just, just the scene of it was so exciting. And being a 10 year old girl, some of the items that meant the most to me were these precious hair clips. I remember seeing the girls around the city uh, who had parents, they had hair clips and they looked so beautiful. But when I was 10, finally, I had several items that were beautiful and shiny and they made me look and feel beautiful. When everything settled down, children sat down and uh, we got a little bit more organized, uh, we were told that today is a very special day and actually these gifts represent even a greater gift and they shared the gospel message with us. I was 10 years old and I remember that message to this day. They talked about a God who we could call our Father and uh, Jesus, his son who came from heaven down to earth to provide for us a way to his Father. And they invited us to accept Jesus into our hearts as our Savior so we could also be adopted into this royal family. You know, all the kids in the orphanage dream of being adopted. So this was, this was, I mean, the greatest message we could have received is the invitation to be adopted. And so, of course, I prayed to receive Jesus. In 2002, I was adopted indeed to a Christian family where I got to learn more about Jesus. And over the years, my faith has grown. And, oh my goodness, it is so clear. There is no mistake in why Operation Christmas Child exists. It's to transform lives, to build believers and evangelists. I am one of them. Praise be to God. That's one story. That's a young lady who actually got a box from someone like Deb <laughs> or Christine or me or you. Um, I was touched by her being thrilled about stuff for her hair. And um, every time I put something like that in the box, I think, oh, this is dumb. It's not. It's not. So, next Saturday, getting together at noon, going to eat some food, and then we got all these gifts that have been donated. We're going to pack boxes. But I would encourage each of you to still pack your own box. All right? So, who needs a box? Here, we got one over here. Here they come. And uh, so we are going to pack boxes on Saturday. Uh, Sunday, if you can bring boxes back, um, and we will have them packed um, during the week, uh, during the, that following week, um, we have to take them uh, to the distribution uh, place in um, Spring Grove. But um, thank you. Thank you for panning those out. Um, Ella, you got packed three of them, I guess. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, all right. Take those home. Um, bring them back next Sunday. Um, come Saturday, fellowship and food, and uh, we will uh, have some, something to eat, and then um, 
Uh, those of you online, if you cannot get hold of a box, uh, you can make your own shoe box. You can drop them off here at church. Or you can go online to Operation Christmas Child, and you can actually donate online and send boxes. Uh, and those boxes actually get to the most difficult places to reach. And, and um, Samaritan's Purse will actually pack them and get them into those places. So I'm excited about how many boxes we're going to do. We're going to stack them up here next Sunday. We're going to gather around them. We're going to pray over them. And we are going to send them out um, to, to, and talk about. There's Ron. There he is. I blamed you for what I just did, sir. I said, who needs a box? And made them raise their hands. And we handed out boxes, OK? All right. So, um, and, uh, so we're going to pray them out of here. And we're going to send them out um, and, and to make a difference for Jesus. So next week we bring our boxes before the Lord. What do we bring before the Lord today? We bring our hopes and our dreams to the Lord. What do we seek? We seek peace for our weary souls. We will find it in this place, for this is the house of the Lord. Open our hearts and our spirits, O Lord, to hear your words of comfort and peace. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace. Hymn number 594, I would invite you to rise as Kathy leads us. perfect peace over all victorious in its bright increase perfect yet it floweth fuller every day perfect yet it spirit there stayed upon a Jehovah hearts are fully blessed binding as he promised perfect peace and rest every joy trial it from above traced upon our dial by the son of love we may trust him fully all for us to do they who trust
you go to prayer with me to that wonderful God who gives us peace. Heavenly Father, we have come today bringing all we have, our lives, our hopes, our dreams, our joys, our fears, our sorrows. We place these before you in faith and hope, knowing no matter what has happened, you are with us. And you are blessing us. Open our hearts to receive your word and your spirit, that we may find healing and comfort. Help us to find encouragement and peace in you today. Lord, we join our hearts before you as we join our voices and lift before you our prayer of confession. Gracious God, so often we look at ourselves, our gifts, and our talents and wonder what you would do with us. We don't think we have much to give. So far too many times we belittle the gifts and turn our backs on the opportunities to serve, believing we cannot possibly make a difference. How foolish we are. Forgive us when we stop listening to you and focus on our anxieties. Heal us, Lord. Help us know you have wonderfully blessed us. Help us to know these blessings are meant to be used to bring joy to others. Help us to bring our lives just as they are to you. Help us to receive your gentle touch and healing grace. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so blessed by God's love for us. Rejoice in that love. Before you are seated, will you go and greet those who are worshiping in the presence of God with you today? finding your way back to your seats. <clears throat> I thought of a couple of things. Um, from first time in Christine and I's uh, relationship with St. Luke's Church, we were not able to be part of Harvest Supper, and we did not enjoy that. <laughs> now, we haven't been doing it for 30 years like some of you, but... but um, um, but from everything that I have heard, Harvest Supper was an absolute success this year. And so I think we need to give a round of applause to those that had a hand in making that happen. And kind of related to that, if anybody tries to tell you that we didn't have church last Sunday because there was an outbreak of COVID at Harvest Supper, 
You put a kibosh on it, okay? It had nothing to do with it, all right? The only thing that rumor has anything to do with is you that have cattle and stuff comes out the back end. <laughs> That's what that rumor is, all right? So there you go. Um, so if you hear anybody, and I, you just tell them, no, that wasn't the deal. Uh, there were other reasons. So there you go. We bring before the Lord our tithes and our offerings. Will you join me? We join together in the prayer of dedication as found in the bulletin. Take these gifts the hand, of our hands and bless and multiply them for the sake of your kingdom alone. Amen. You may be seated. It is... Uh, Sincerely um, good to be standing in the pulpit before you. Um, uh, it, it, it's much better than where Christine and I spent the last couple of Sundays. So um, we are glad to be here. Um, during our time away, I thought, oh man, you know, and I'm, I'm sick, so I gotta stay at home. I'm gonna get a lot of reading done. Well, uh, we were too sick to read, so then you start watching TV. And I, I am fully uh, uh, caught up on all the Hallmark movies now, and uh, except for the ones that were on last night. So, um, but during our uh, time, uh, last Sunday night, in fact, um, I did um, watch Dallas Cowboys play a supposedly professional team from the state of Minnesota, which reminded me, by the way, of the reason that Iowa doesn't have a professional team. It's because then Minnesota would want one, too. Those were all for Glenn's benefit. Uh, no. um, but... Uh, I, I, I did. I got really frustrated and I got um, angry and 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 so I remembered that the uh, the World Series was on and so I I flipped over and started to watch some of the World Series. Now I haven't watched uh, baseball for years and uh, while I was watching it, I was reminded of why I liked baseball and and I was reminded of. Of, of what it was about baseball that I so enjoyed. And, and in fact, I enjoyed it so much that I actually watched the rest of the World Series during the week and got to watch Atlanta um, win the World Series. And it reminded me, I am old enough to know uh, some of the great names of baseball. Um, for those, uh, obviously, uh, with twins, you know, we, we got the Kirby Puckett years and the Kent Herbeck, and, and then you go back a little further, and um, Tony Oliva and Rod Carew and Harmon Killebrew and Ted Ulander and Al Worthington and Jim Cott. I mean, these were all names that I grew up with. But I remember older names as well um, prior to being a Twins fan. And there's one name that came to my mind um, several a weeks ago, and you're going to see why. Uh, but um, a great name in baseball, a guy who was a catcher, a manager, a coach, a Hall of Famer. But what he's most famous for is some of the things that he would say. 
And actually, it became, you can, they are called yogi-isms, okay? And there was a guy by the name of Yogi Berra. And he would say things that would just make you go, huh? Okay? And one of the things that he said when he witnessed Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris hit back-to-back -back home runs twice in the same game, he said it was deja vu all over again. Which is really a silly thing to say, right? Because deja vu is that strange feeling that you've lived through a present situation before. And so what Yogi Berra was saying was, you know what? It was like deja vu, deja vu, all over again, I'm doing it all over again. And I got to tell you, I actually have been working on this sermon for over a month and, 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 and for me, this really is, in fact, those of you that are astute in these things will remember that two weeks ago, that was the name of the sermon that was going to be in the bulletin. It was actually in the bulletin, and then I could not make it. So for me, I, I, I told Dana this morning, I said, well, we were getting ready to pray. I said, this really is deja vu all over again for me. But in the text that we're going to look at, you may get some of those feelings as well. And you may ex find yourself experiencing a little bit of deja vu all over again. It's about Jesus feeding a bunch of people. And you may be thinking, well, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus, you just did that a few weeks ago, Michael. You did, well, Jesus just got done feeding a bunch of people, and you'd be right. A couple chapters earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, he fed 5,000 men, and then it tells us, plus women and children. And in fact, unbelieving Bible critics people who do not think that the Word of God is the Word of God, land on something like this and they say, see, it's a repeat of the original story. This can't be the Word of God. It can't be the inspired Word of God. I don't got time this morning to show you all the reasons that that's false. You just need to go with it. That's wrong. And the biggest reason it's wrong is that a little later in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus actually says there were two different events where people were fed out in the wilderness. So Mark didn't run out of material and just kind of rehash a story. And this second event that we call the feeding of the 4,000 has its own lessons. So I would invite you to turn there. Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. In the Red Pew Bible, you can find it on page 1569. And I would encourage you to follow along as we take a look at it. And the first thing that we see is the need Jesus was eager to address. Let's take a look. Uh, it says, During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciple to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they'll collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. Take a break right there. The phrase, during those days, right there in the beginning of verse 1, is one of the things that tells us that this is a separate feeding, that this feeding of 4,000 was happening during the days that Jesus was traveling through um, what was known as the Decapolis, Deca being ten, Opolis being city, the, the area of the ten cities, which was Gentile territory. It was not Jewish territory. Territory. The other feeding happened in Jewish territory. So during those days, while he was traveling through the Decapolis, at the end of verse 1, it, Mark tells us Jesus called his disciples to him. 
Now the word for called here literally means summoned. And Mark uses it whenever Jesus is about to do something kind of big. So when you are reading in the Gospel of Mark, and it says, and Mark uses this phrase, Jesus called his disciples, pay attention. Your ears should perk up. You should hold your breath, because something great, something big is going to happen. And then in verse 2, Jesus said, I have compassion for these people. And again, the word that it's translated compassion there. It's, it's more than just, you know, oh, I feel sorry for him. Uh, it's, it's more than just a fleeting response to this situation. But it, 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 it really means being moved intently. And it really fits with um, several weeks ago now when we talked about Jesus' sigh language. And we've seen Jesus' um, compassion on individuals, on groups. And he had compassion when, when people suffered uh, greatly from diseases and, and from de demon de de possession. But he also had compassion on something as simple as missing a few meals. What it reminds us is there is, whoops, where'd it go? Wall, that's too bad. Um, I had a really neat slide, and it says there is no problem so great or so small. God does not care about it. Did you hear that? There is no problem so great or so small that God doesn't care about it. That Jesus said the reason he had compassion on these people was because they'd been with him for three days. Some of them had come from a long ways away. Now to be hungry for a day or so, that's not bad. But some of these people had remained for like three days long after their supplies ran out because they wanted to hear more about Jesus and more from Jesus. And Jesus knew that some of them were going to collapse on their way home. So what we get to experience is deja vu all over again the first time. So hang with me on this, all right? The first time, look at verses 4 and 5. His disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. Did you catch the deja vu for the first time? Deja vu all over again for the first time here? Wasn't this exactly what the disciples asked when Jesus fed the 5,000? Hadn't they learned anything? I mean, it's really only a few weeks since Jesus had fed the 5,000. And I got to thinking to myself, what is wrong with these guys? I mean, how, how, how short-sighted, how, how forgetful, how lacking in belief were they? Even when they had just recently, just like, like a couple of weeks before, experienced Jesus feeding a whole bunch of people out in the middle of nowhere, their first thought was not, oh, Jesus can take care of this. But then I realized... We need to be careful judging the disciples too harshly. Because haven't we been guilty of the same thing? How many times? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But how many times have you and I We've gone through some kind of a crisis in our lives and, and we've seen God get us through with some, with some miracle that saved the day or, or, or by God giving us strength to get through it with Him right by our side. And then the first time we go through the same kind of thing, 
Well, we, we panic, we worry, we fret, we struggle, we complain to God. But in the end, God brings us through and he gets us through the crisis and we come out the other side stronger and better for it. And then sometime later, the same stuff starts to happen again. And instead of turning to Jesus, instead of trusting him to guide us through it and give us peace and strength and endurance, what do we do? We panic, we struggle, we worry, we fret, we complain to God just like we did the first time. So the question really is, how slow are we to learn? You know, God has given every one of us a lifetime to figure out this relationship with him thing. And it's a good thing because it takes a lifetime for many of God's character traits to, to get seared into us enough so that we actually begin to change. If it's any consolation to you, as Christine and I have grown older, we have uh, finally, maybe that much, started to learn some of the lessons of faith God has needed us to go through. And so, yeah, I don't know what happened. I lost another slide. But here's the deal. One of the things we've learned, one of the things Scripture teaches us, if we persevere, keep going, don't give up. If we persevere in crisis, there's hope. There's hope that change will come. When we give up, nothing's going to change. And what we see next in the story of the feeding of the 4,000 here is what I've labeled deja vu all over again again. When Jesus takes command and begins to, to, to actually meet the needs of the people, look at verse 6. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground, and when he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and, and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. And he gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied, and afterward the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. And after he had sent them on the way, he got into the boat and his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. As in the first feeding, this is where you get the deja vu all over again, again. As in the first feeding, Jesus had the people sit down on the ground. Then he gave thanks for the food they were about to eat. As in the first feeding, the crowd ate and was, uh, they got little small rolls, little fishes. And when they had eaten, they were filled. But this time, this time there's something different. This time they had a lot more left over. The word for basket in the first feeding is a small wicker basket that we might think of as a picnic basket that we might take a meal in, one meal in, and, and go out for a picnic. The word Mark uses for basket in this event is uh, they were large um, baskets that you would put all your rope in or large mats in. In fact, many of them were large enough so that people could get in 
them, a person could fit in these baskets. So even though the number of baskets, only seven were gathered here, 12 were gathered in the first feeding, one for each disciple. In this one, you end up with a lot more left over because the baskets are so much bigger. And once everyone was fed, once everyone was satisfied, Jesus sent them home. So last time when we talked about the feeding of the 5,000, I showed you and we talked about some applications that, uh, from that event in our lives. I'm not going to repeat those because that would be deja vu all over again. But a couple of things different in this event stick out to me. And first of all, it kind of goes back to something I already said. Jesus cares about even the little things in our lives. Now, the crowd was hungry. Um, they probably had brought at least a day's worth of food with them. Uh, most of them were probably not in serious, starved-to-death kind of situation. But even so, Jesus had compassion for them. Jesus cares for us. Little things, big things. Jesus said, Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? And not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Throughout God's word, we see he is interested in more than just the big things in our lives. He cares about every piece of our life, every piece of who we are. Why? Because we are his creation, made in his image. And God cares for his entire creation, plants, animals, the, the environment, all of that stuff. But Jesus also said, he went back to the birds and he said, Behold the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Think about this. If God cares so deeply about the needs of birds or plants, or the environment that were not made in his image and have no ability to choose or reject him, how much more does he care about our daily lives, our daily needs, our daily struggles? God cares about the little things in our lives because he cares about us. We are more than little things to him. Now I know, I know God doesn't always answer our prayers the way we want him to, in either big things or little things. But we know from Scripture, Jesus cares about us. How much does he care about you? We're going we're gonna to do it right here. That's how much he cared. He stretched his arms out, and he let them be nailed to a cross because he cares for you. Peter knew this. He said, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. I think there's one more thing that God wants us to see in the event of this feeding of the 4,000. 
and it has to do with what we do at this table. Because you see, I think God wants us to see Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus himself said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. And why? Why did Jesus refer to himself as the bread of life? Well, what we need to understand is bread was not a side dish in the times of Jesus. Bread was like me growing up. Every meal, you had bread. In fact, I have a granddaughter who claims there is always room for bread. No matter how full you are, oh, I can have a bun, you know, I, there's always room for bread. It was an essential food. It was a staple, a basic dietary item in almost every single meal they ate. And we know that a person can live quite a while on just bread and water. And when Jesus said he is the bread of life, he was saying he is essential for life, for physical life, and for eternal life. He's essential for eternal life and for our spiritual life in the same way that bread is essential for physical life. I need you to listen carefully. You've heard me say this before. But we need to hear it again. Jesus is not just one way to get through life. Jesus is not just one way to the Father. Jesus is not just one way to get to heaven or to have your sins forgiven. He is the only way. He is essential. And Jesus left no room at all for other roads to God when he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Just like bread, Jesus is essential to our lives. And every one of us, every one of us who's come to Jesus Christ has some sort of event, some sort of, some story or something when we realized the absolute necessity of Jesus in our life. We realize that he was essential, the essential element, the only essential element to know God and to be with God. Listen again to Jesus' words. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. And you, every single person in this room, every single person watching this online, you are invited to come to Jesus this morning. Now, I know there's a lot of you that think you have done that. I mean, come on. I've been coming to church for a long time. I sit in the pew. I sing the songs. I say the words. I put money in the offering plate. I take part in communion. I help out at harvest supper for goodness sake. What you need to know is God 
God has laid a passion on my heart. Some people, for Paul, it was to reach the Gentiles. For Peter, it was to reach the Jews. Some are called by God to, to go across the ocean and, and reach, go to unreached people groups. Or some are called to, here in the United States even, to, to reach people who, who, uh, uh, have, uh, who don't go to church. God has called me to reach the unsaved who are coming to church. And there's a lot of you. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to look at any one specific person, okay? When we come to Jesus and we realize that he's more important than my life. He's more important than my spouse. He's more important than my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. He's more important than my brothers and my sisters and my nephews and my nieces. He's more important than my, my, my aunts and my uncles. He's more important than my friends and my co-workers. He's more important than my job. He's more important than, than my career. He's more important than, than... I'll stop there before I get in trouble. When we realize that, that's, that's when things begin to change. And I think a lot of us have put that, that, that realization off because we don't want our life to change. I'm out of time, I'm out of breath. How's that? But I encourage you to invite him into your life in a way that you maybe you never have. And to say, I understand you are the only way. You are the bread. When we do that, when you do that, your soul, your spirit will never hunger, will never thirst again. And this table is where we go to remind ourselves of all that Jesus has done, all he wants to do, all we have to do is let him in. So take a few moments and invite him in. You know, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, and all of those guys who saw all that stuff deserted him. 
You know, it wasn't just Peter that deserted him. All of them did. He knew that was going to happen. He told him it was going to happen. He got them together and he, he took bread and he gave thanks just like he did when he fed the 5,000, just like he did when he fed the 4,000. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, he gave it to him and he, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood poured out for you for all people for the forgiveness of sin do this as often as you drink of it for the remembrance of me remember I said if we really let Jesus in that our soul and our spirit won't hunger. It won't thirst anymore. Because the greatest feast you will ever eat is right here. Let us pray. Dear God, you, 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 you are a God who, who changes things. You change anything that comes before you. I think that's why we're so scared, God, to come before you. Because we know you're going to change us. Because the touch of your grace... Your mercy. <laughs> we cannot remain the same. And so, God, we come before you. And we ask you to allow your spirit to do some change in here today. to make these ordinary gifts of bread and cup into the extraordinary presence of Jesus Christ. Hold us as your own, Lord. Renew us as your people. Change us with your love. Servers, would you come and serve? I would invite you to hold your portion until all have been served so that we can eat and drink together.
looks and feels like a little piece of styrofoam, doesn't it? But what it represents is essential. It's essential for our physical life, for our spiritual life, for our eternal life. Break and we eat together. Looks and feels like a little plastic cup with some red stuff in it. But when we come to Jesus, what it means is we will never be thirsty again. We drink together. God's people have united their hearts, their minds, and their voices, crossed centuries, space, and time, and taken before him the prayer he gave us, our Father, who art in heaven.
Okay, so my plan was to get you out of here earlier because I wanted to get out early. How's that? God had a different plan. I've been um, waiting for an opportunity to sing a song that we sang a little while ago. And I learned that it was new for most of you. I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus. Kathy, would you lead us as we rise together and sing hymn 621? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.